All right. Um, let's see. Your design is due this week, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Do you have questions? Okay. But like I got my topic, I want to talk about uh, uh, what was the uh, uh, food that they like. Okay. Not literally what developers and how many, what they use for spray and stuff like that. But yeah. Okay. Here is, here is, here's my thought on that. All right. If you're having trouble with this, and this goes, this goes for anyone, not just for the student that asks. But if you're having trouble with it, try to, as soon as you can, send me what you have. All right. Um, the, the student indicated that they had reviewed it a few times, and they're still kind of confused about what was expected. And, and I can understand that. Um, my suggestion would be to take a shot at it, all right, and turn it in. And well, let me rephrase that. Um, email it to me, all right. Remember, it's always better if you want a quick answer to email instead of grading. I've actually done a pretty good job, knock on wood, keeping up grading, uh, at least for the most part. Um, but if you want a more timely answer, you know, I grade typically once a week, but I respond to my email every day. So if you're not sure about something like on the project design or really any assignment, email it to me and say you have questions. What I like, though, is that you, you at least give a shot at trying to do it. All right, because then I can look at what you have and say, okay, change this, change that, or this part of it's right, this part of it uh, might need work, and so on. So that's my suggestion to you uh, if you're having confusion about that. So no amount is too little. So if you just, you know, if you just have, uh, if you don't even literally know um, what to do at all, try to do the first section. All right, and and. To the best of your ability, try to do what the first section of the design is asking you to do. And turn it in, and I'll take a look at it, and we'll decide if it, you know, we'll decide if it needs work. And then you can go on to the next section and the next section. Uh, remember, as far as, you know, it is due this Wednesday, I believe, your design for your project. But as far as that goes, I'd rather see something that's done, like, really well that you turn in Friday than something that is, you know, um, not, not so good, yeah, or so-so, or whatever that's turned in on time. Uh, there's value to turning stuff in on time, all right? But there's also value in getting things right and, and learning it. And different instructors take different approaches, and I'm not here to, you know, I'm not here to, to debate approaches. Uh, I'm just saying my approach is I'd rather see something done really, really well and really right. So take uh, the time to ask the questions. And if you're asking questions and we're in a dialogue, you know, um, then, um, then, then you know, you'll be fine grade-wise. Other thing I would suggest, you know, take a look at what other people are doing in class. For those of you that are in class, um, you know, you can ask in lab, hey, you know, what have you done so far for the design and see what they've done. Um, if you uh, are online, you know, if you know someone else in the class, you know, you could email. Otherwise, uh, post to the bulletin board and maybe people can put examples of stuff that they've done uh, online and, and so on. Um, so we'll get through this, all right? Uh, we're, on the, we're on the homeward stretch. And for the most part, your project, you know, you know with, with only with, with a couple of, uh, how do I want to put this? For the most part, you should have pretty much what you need to know to finish the project. All right, we're covering some additional stuff to be sure. It's not like we're just going to be wasting our time for the last five weeks or so. But um, you have pretty much what you need to do that. So getting your project done is a really high priority in this class in addition to the other homework assignments. But the project is a big priority. So if you have questions at all, bring them to my attention, and we'll, we'll figure out, and we'll, we'll work through them. Yeah. Sure. The portfolio, can I? Um, I'm getting classes online in different schools. Uh -huh. And uh, um, my professor, he, he offered like a free uh, portfolio. Can I 
Um, I would rather you write the portfolio yourself. And, and if I remember right, what you turned in the first time was, was good, I think. Uh, I, I, if I remember right. Uh, or I might be mistaken. Uh, but at any rate, I, I would rather you write it yourself because, you know, to take, that, that's a different skill set to take sort of a, a framework and, and build a portfolio. I'd, I'd rather you create the portfolio from scratch. All right. Okay. Uh, three principles of the web by Peret's founder, Tim Berners-Lee. One of them is universality, decentralization, and separation. You don't have anything on the viewing screen yet. No, you don't, because I have to press this button. All right, we're going to focus on this one today, universality. So the founder of the web says one of the three fundamental principles is universality, and here is his definition or description of that. When you make a link, you can link to anything. That means people must be able to put anything on the web, no matter what computer they have, software they use, human language that they speak, whether they have a wired or wireless connection. All right? This is one of the fundamental principles of the web is universality. If you think about the web, if it was the Microsoft World Wide Web or the Apple World Wide Web, or the Linux World Wide Web, or the computer World Wide Web, as opposed to the mobile device World Wide Web, or if it was the United States World Wide Web, or the European World Wide Web. None of these things would be as powerful as the World Wide Web. So the sort of the assumption from the start was that it would be universal. I mean, if I remember right, even in Independence Day, the movie, when the aliens came from outer space, Will Smith was able to tap onto their computer pretty quickly, all right, and hack it. I might be remembering the wrong sci-fi movie. So it seems like it was on the web too, right, as quickly as he was able to do it. But at any rate, the whole idea of the web is universality. So it shouldn't matter what device you have, whether you have a desktop device, a laptop, a handheld device. It shouldn't matter what the brand of the device is. If you have Apple or a Microsoft product or a Dell computer or a uh, Motorola phone or whatever, none of these things should matter because it should be universal. All right? And if the web wasn't universal, it wouldn't be nearly as powerful. If like, you were like, well, I'm using a Hewlett Packard computer, so I'm going to go to search engine A, and someone else is using a Dell computer, and they had to go to search engine B. That wouldn't nearly be as powerful as experience as the web. With the web, all that's required is that certain protocols are followed. There are certain protocols, HTTP, um, TCP IP, all these are different ways. And as long as a computer system or any sort of system can follow these rules, it can connect to the web. All right, that's, that's the beauty and the strength of the web. Now, there's one factor that comes into play that sometimes people forget, and that is about the different abilities and disabilities of individuals. All right, because universal means that anyone can do it, and anyone is sort of a broad spectrum of people, right? Everyone has different abilities and disabilities. And for the web to truly live up to its complete potential, it ought to be as universal as possible. And that means that even people who are disabled should have the ability to access it. All right. What are some of uh, disabilities that would affect someone's ability to get information off the web? Number one is blind. All right. 
That's the one that's like the most obvious one that people can think of because typically you look at web pages. Okay, and let's put underneath that visual impairment. And that's a great thing to bring up. Because sometimes you hear people talking about accessibility as being, you know, well, we have to make our website so that blind people can access them. And really, how important is that? Because how many people are blind? Ooh, that kind of stuff makes me cringe for a couple reasons. First of all, you know, there's a substantial number of people that are blind, and they're people too. And they ought not to be limited or restricted, you know, by barriers that we put up or by things or by steps that we don't take to make our websites accessible by people that are blind. So sometimes you hear the argument accessibility issues such as the ones I'm going to discuss don't really affect a lot of people. But they do. Because for a number of reasons. First of all, blindness is not the only disability that's relevant here. And we'll talk about some more disabilities in a second. But the other thing that comes into a play is for almost every disability that you have, there's sort of the extreme case of it where someone is blind. But then there are sort of lesser degrees of it where there's still an impact and there's still difficulty posed by this. All right? So what are some other ranges? What are other, other, other kinds of visual impairment that would affect the ability of someone to access the web besides total blindness? Absolutely. Color blindness. OK. We'll come to that later. All right. Right now, we're just talking about vision things. But that's an excellent point. There are other, other sorts of abilities or disabilities that can cause a problem. So color bl uh, blindness would be one. Dyslexia isn't, strictly speaking, a vision uh, issue. It is vision related. We'll put that down. Or we'll, we'll come back to that one, so remember these. Okay. There, there, are, there are people that are prone to seizures or epilepsy. All right. Again, that's not strictly speaking a vision-related problem. But we'll come back to those. Uh, I guess you could be blind. You can be colorblind. You can just have poor eyesight. All right? That affects people. All right? So no one in this class, I would assume, is blind. All right? Uh, I haven't seen any behavior that would indicate that. Is anyone in the class colorblind? All right? Uh, is anyone in the class have what they would consider poor eyesight? Yeah, absolutely me. All right? So. That affects it because, you know, um, if something is small, I can't see it. If, there, if the color contrast isn't good, I might not be able to see it, and so on. All right? So you don't have to be blind to be affected by the way that a website is designed. If you have a lesser degree of uh, an impairment, such as simply poor vision, um, you can also be affected. Now, there's two things that allow people to get around disabilities on the web. Let's start with vision, first of all, and then we'll go off to some of the other areas. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is vision, because again, that's the most obvious disability. All right? uh, it, but there's two things that sort of help people with disabilities access the web. And one of them is called assistive technology. And the other is called universal design. All right? So we're going to keep these things in the back of our mind as we go forward. But let's define them and give some examples of it. 
Assistive technology is simply a combination of hardware and software that allows people to better access the web. I'll give you an example of assistive technology. This right here. I go to a web page. My browser allows me to resize the text. So if I come to a web page and it's small and I can't read it, there's technology that will help me with that. There's assistive technology. And I can simply make the text bigger. That's a very small, simple example of assistive technology that can be used. That built into web browsers, there's the ability to zoom in. So you can't read the print because it's too small. You go to that, and you can make it bigger. All right. There's other <coughs> examples of assistive technology. And in Windows, we can access them, if I remember, in this version of Windows. If we go to the control panel, Um, they're all grouped together somewhere. Ease of Access Center. Always scan this section. One of them is a narrator. All right. Microsoft Windows and other operating systems sometimes have built into them a narrator which actually reads the screen to someone. Now, start magnifier. If I go and start click narrator. Start narrator. Starting narrator. Ease of access center. Start on screen keyboard. Button. Ease of access setup high contrast. Button. Alt plus U. If Tool, you go and Tim access Berners, this. Ease of Access Center, Start Magnifier, Button, Alt plus G. Ease of Access Center, Start Narrator, Button, Alt plus N. Tool, start on Screen Keyboard, Button, Alt plus K. On Screen Keyboard makes it set up high. Narrator Settings, to navigate the options in this dialog, Ease of Access Center, Start Magnifier, Button, Alt plus G. Tim Berners-Lee, Three principles of the web ease of access center. Okay, this is start a bit narrator. Behind. Tim Berners Lee. Three principles of the web: universality, decentralization, and separation. Technology voice. Google Chrome. Scan off. Notice as I tab through it. Tab. 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 Space. Tab. 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 Tab, space, space. Question for you. When you do the tab, why does it not tell you what that tab is? That is a darn good question. Window. Tab. Tab. Narrator settings. To navigate the options in this dialog, including an option for the online user guide, press the up and down arrow keys. To review the full set of narrator commands, Press caps lock plus F1. To start and stop narrator from the keyboard, press the Windows logo key plus control plus enter. Scan off. Caps lock. Search all commands. Okay. Control stops reading. Move to the next item is cap locks plus right arrow. Stop reading. Control. Do primary action. Caps lock plus enter. Move to next item, caps lock plus right arrow, move to you previous can set item, the caps lock plus left arrow, M. chain. Tim Berners Lee, three principles of not unexplorable text. Cap not unexplorable text. Okay. Exiting narrator. I'm not particularly good at using narrator, but the idea is, is that if you get the settings right and you uh, use it, you can access web pages and it will narrate the web pages to you. I didn't have all the settings right. I'm not really sure what I was doing wrong in there. Um, but 
that's a piece of assistive technology. I think I've talked about before, uh, I did a summer fellowship at NASA, and my office mate was a high school student that was blind, and she was able to navigate and do pretty much anything that any high school student her age could do, you know, including uh, chatting with her friends on instant messaging when she should have been working, uh, but using the, uh, using the screen narrator. Uh, and it was funny, because every now and then, uh, I would come in, you know, uh, I'm not a morning person, so I'd come in a lot later than her. And as I would come in, she would be sitting in the office in the dark with the screen turned off, working away at the computer, which kind of was a shock to me. But if you can't read the screen, what's the point of having the monitor on? You're saving electricity by having it off. And the screen narrator should have headphones on sometimes, sometimes she wouldn't. But the screen narrator would tell her where she was on the screen, what she needed to do, and so on. She made PowerPoint presentations, surfed the web, did everything. On occasion, she would call me over to ask me what the cursor was doing, if there was a page that was poorly designed or something where she couldn't get around it. So she got stuck once in a while, but she was able, for the most part, to do what she needed to do with that. So assistive technology is a key part of that. And there's other pieces of assistive technology as well. Um, There is a on-screen keyboard that can allow you to type using a keyboard. If you had very limited mobility, like for example, you mentioned someone in an extreme case of someone who didn't have hands, or maybe if they were one. yeah, one hand or partly paralyzed or whatever, they could use a pointing device. You know, the most famous case of course, is Stephen Hawking, who would use a pointing device to point to an on-screen keyboard as opposed to typing on a physical keyboard. Uh, optimize uh, for blindness, all right? A lot of processing in the computer goes to displaying the screen. If you don't have to worry about displaying the screen, you can put that processing power to work doing something else. So you can optimize that. Voice commands, a great example of it. Use computers without a mouse or keyboard. Set up alternative input devices. That would include the microphone and speech recognition. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That would be another case of it if you had problems with mobility. Uh, <laughs> make the computer easier to see. You can, for example, pick a high contrast theme that makes it more, more uh, uh, easy to see, a, a greater contrast between the lights and the darks uh, on the screen. You can uh, also use, um, sometimes you can, you can allow users to use their own style sheets on a page, where you could pick a color scheme that worked and through the browser supply a style sheet that would that would style the contact that would, content that would make it easier to read, and so on. So there's a lot of things that can be done as far as technology goes that can help people. And this is, again, just scratching the surface. Just as important to that is the principles of universal design. Because you can defeat assistive technology with bad design, right? In the physical world, a wheelchair is an example of assistive technology. Right? You can have a wheelchair and that helps people that can't walk get around. Right? However, if you had no wheelchair ramps, if you designed the building to have no wheelchair ramps, or if you designed a building to not have an elevator, or if you designed the doors to be too small, too, too narrow, all these things would defeat the assistive technology. So the technology by itself isn't enough. You, you know, there are design principles that you put into play that will help everyone. Here's the idea about universal design. All right. Um, with universal design, the two main principles are simplicity and multiple presentation. Uh, 
all right? Simplicity means just as it's implied. Simple websites are, are typically going to be more accessible than big, confusing, overwhelming websites. Uh, I don't even want to do this for fear of breaking the computer, but could you imagine what this site would look like if we had it read through a screen reader? it would be a disaster. It's a disaster just trying to read it. This site is always mentioned by students as one of the bad websites when I ask students to pick bad websites. So this is a classic. Where did, where did, where did you get it from? Uh, it is, no, it's actually in the United Kingdom. Wow. And uh, he, uh, this, this guy sells or releases Cars. We should, we should move there and just help them with the website. You know, I almost think that this, that this guy is intentionally bad just to attract attention. All right? Uh, I, I don't know. I, 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 I almost think that the website is intentionally designed poorly on purpose to get people talking about it. But that's another question whether that's. Yeah, he's famous now, exactly. The Guardian says Ling Valentine is Britain's biggest individual seller of new cars. So he probably lives in a bigger house than me, so maybe, maybe, uh, you know, maybe I should take lessons from him instead of the other way around, right? Now, contrast that with if you went to, say, Apple's website. Apple's going to have a relatively easier time with a screen reader telling you what to do, right? Okay, so first of all, keep it simple. Simplicity helps with accessibility, all right? The second thing is sort of a paradox, <coughs> and that is multiple presentation. Multiple presentation can mean a lot of different things, but essentially it means either showing things two different ways or giving the option to show things two different ways. Let's talk about someone being deaf for a second. Let's change up the, the, the disability that we're talking about. Um, if there was a video, what can we do for someone that's deaf? Yes. Subtitle? Subtitle. Absolutely. Oh, and, and if, if the person was born deaf, it's very different the subtitle than another person who was born deaf. Uh, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Because, like, what is the difference? The difference is who was born deaf. You don't know what that word means. You can know somebody else tell you. That's fair. That's fair. You could have subtitles. The other thing you could do is you, have a tr you could have a transcript. Let's say I had an interview uh, between me and a musician, all right, on, on a site, or me and an artist. Um, you could have a video where you show that, and you could also have a transcript of the interview, all right? Now, universal design would say that that's a good thing, right? Now, you might think that that contradicts simplicity. Wouldn't simplicity have, uh, say, just, you know, just do it one way, don't do it a couple different ways, that's complicated. And the answer is no, it's sort of a balancing act, all right? Um, you wouldn't, for example, necessarily need to have a subtitles, and a transcript. That might be overkill. But if you have a couple ways to do it to accommodate people of different disabilities, then I think you're uh, in the mark. Now, here's the interesting thing about that. Something like, like a transcript of an interview might help people that aren't deaf. How so? How could you, let's say you have an interview, you have a video of an interview, and then you have posted underneath it the transcript of it. How could that help someone that's not deaf? Some people learn uh, better visually than they do here. OK. Go ahead.
Okay, that might help reinforce something if they're if they're having trouble concentrating. What if you're in a noisy room, all right, and it's hard to hear something? What if you're in a room like our lab that doesn't have speakers on your computer and you didn't bring your headphones that day? Or what if you're like looking at this and say, do I want to listen to this interview or not? I can read really fast, right? I could scan the reading and say, hey, this is something I'm interested in. I'll watch it. Or, okay, I got the, I got the important points and I don't really need to see the full details. So those are all things that presenting a transcript along with a video could help people that aren't just deaf. All right? Then, again, as far as deafness goes, there are people that are deaf and there are people that simply have lost a little bit of their hearing. All right? One thing that you'll notice with these and, um, is that um, age-related conditions is almost a little bit of all of these disabilities. All right? So in other words, as people get older, they don't necessarily go blind, but their vision tends to be compromised. People that get older don't necessarily go deaf, but their hearing might not be as good. So you can sort of lump all the disabilities, milder forms of them, under age-related conditions, and you have a whole population of people that experience difficulty. I'm trying to bring this up for a few reasons. Again, first of all, to counter the thought that website accessibility is an issue that only affects a small number of people, the totally blind. It affects a whole bunch of people, all right? And the things that we do for accessibility can also benefit people that are not disabled. Just like in the physical world, right? There are elevators here, right? And the elevators, you would say, is a piece of assistive technology to help people in wheelchairs get up to the second floor, right? But what else is an elevator useful to someone that isn't in a wheelchair? Or lazy. <laughs> well, if you're lazy, all right? If, you, if you're tired, all right, if you had a tough day, all right, and you just can't face walking up a flight of stairs, all right? In Chicago, uh, my brother was in Chicago, and uh -huh. uh, he said uh, you only allow like personal people go to the stairs. Right. Like not everybody, you have to use the elevator no matter what. Right, okay, right. So, yeah, that, that might be a security issue in that case, yeah. Uh, but like thinking of me, you know, I've, I've had hip surgery, I've had heart surgery. You know, there's days I don't feel so good. And it's like, ah, I, you know, I know I probably could, wouldn't kill me, but I'm, I'm going to take the elevator today. It or, take you there to kill you. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Or I'm running late for class, right? And I want to get up quicker, so I do that. Yeah, you, especially if you hit the elevator button a bunch of times, that makes it go quicker, right? So my point is, is that all these things that we do for accessibility, we do them for accessibility reasons, but they also benefit other people. Or, at the very least, they don't get in other people's way. I've heard people say that. Well, if we design a website for the blind, we're going to dumb down our content, right? We're going to, we're going to remove content and make it less interesting or make it, um, you know, uh, not as full featured or whatever. And that's a misunderstanding of accessible websites. Truly, if you use the principles of universal design, you're not going to do that. It doesn't mean don't have animations on your site. It doesn't mean don't have videos on your site. It doesn't mean don't have audio on your site. But provide an alternative, all right? And those alternatives will, will help people that have a disability, but it will also uh, help people that, for whatever reason, don't choose to or need the alternate presentation. <clears throat> and at the very worst, people can just ignore those uh, other presentations. For example, uh, if you look at the room number outside, there's a 105 outside, but it's also written in Braille, all right? Now, did it bother you that it was written in Braille? You know, did you think, oh, the fact that it's written in Braille in addition to be written with regular numbers, that makes it harder for me to get into the room? Or that makes it, you know, less difficult or more difficult or, or compromises the design of the building or anything? No, 
you know. Chances are there might be some people that don't even notice that it's written in Braille outside. You might go past it every day and not see that, all right? And that's the idea of, of universal design. You design it in such a way that you keep it simple, you provide alternatives. Those alternatives help people with disabilities, but they also help other people as well, all right? And if they don't help, at least they don't get in the way, all right? I go to a web page that has a video and I watch the video. Does it bother me that there's a link for the transcript underneath it? Probably not. Okay, now let's look at the, the disability that we started looking at, vision impaired. And let's think of simplicity. and multiple presentation. Simplicity would be things like not too much text on a page. Again, think about Apple, where there's not text on top of text on top of text. Compare that with Ling's cars where there's all this stuff in your face. He really wants to sell you a car. This is difficult for even eight, you know, people without visual impairment to read. For people that are visually impaired, I would imagine it would be even more difficult to read. So if you keep it simple, that's going to help those people that have difficulty with, um, with visual uh, impairment. Use simple fonts. Make sure your fonts are easy to read. Don't use some of them crazy decorative fonts that um, you might think look good, but make it impossible or difficult to read. Use good, simple color combinations. With good contrast. Those are examples of simplicity on a website that will help people that are visually impaired. If your, tech, if your page is simply designed, a screen reader will have an easier time with it. Now, multiple presentations. What are some things that we can do multiple presentations? Well, have text along with audio. That would be one way. Use the alt attribute on images. That's a form of multiple presentation, right? You're going to say, <laughs> if you have an image, you're going <coughs> to say in the alt uh, attribute what the image represents. And there's even another attribute, a description attribute, where you can link to a page that describes an image in more detail.
finding um, a good one that I want to see. Let's see, look, look at this. A long description, that's the one I was thinking of. You can give a URL to give a de uh, detailed description of it. It also looked like there was a title attribute. with image. These things are useful for uh, people that are blind, but they're also useful for search engine optimization if you define an image. Because if your image is ABC123 JPEG, the search en engine has no idea what that means. But if you have all attributes and title attributes and long description attributes, you can tell what the image is for. Another example of multiple uh, presentations is with, for people that are colorblind, a warning. Typically, you might think of a warning as being in red text. All right? And for people that can see red, that's a good idea, right? Because if everything on the page is in black text, if you have something in red text, it's going to make it stand out, right? Well, people that are colorblind, something in red text is not going to stand out. It's just going to look like gray, all right? And therefore, um, that won't be effective. So what could you do to make a message, an error message, a warning message, something that you want to stand out? How could you make something stand out on your web page other than using the color? The design? The design, how so? Um, like, if it's a scroll with an X in both, that means it's dangerous. Okay. You could use an image along with it, right? If you had uh, a, a warning that this is a hazardous chemical or whatever, skull and crossbones next to it, next to the words that says, hey, this is dangerous, would be a great example. Again, multiple presentations. An icon with some text. What would be another example? Bold. Bold. Make it bold. Make it italics. Put a border around it. Um, Make it a different font. Make it a bigger font. All right? All these are things that you could do to make it stand out that don't relate to color. So as far as colorblind go, where multiple, where multiple presentation comes in is that, well, um, don't just use color for things that you want to stand out. Use something else as well. Put a border around it. Flashing. Put an image. Flashing you probably want to avoid. Yeah, but, but there's other issues with things flashing, and we'll talk about those uh, next time. That's difficult for people that are prone to seizures, and it's also for people that have ADHD. That can be dis a distraction. All right, so you want to draw attention to it. There's probably better ways to do it than, than doing that. But a small icon next to it would be great. Making it bold would be great. Changing the border around it would be great. Those are all examples of multiple presentations. So we're not just going to change the color. Yeah, we'll make the text red, but we'll make it bold and red. Or we'll make it uh, uh, a different font in red. Or we'll make it a bigger font in, in red. Um, what I want to pick up on, I just want to show you this to start now, is there are actually colorblind filters that allow us to see what pages look like for people that are color blind. Because actually, the word color blind is a simplification, right? Um, there's all kinds of different variations of color blindness. It's not like colorblind people see in black and white. There's a number of them, and it all depends on the rods and the cones in your eyes and which ones work and which ones don't and so on. This is an example of a page. This is how someone that can see colors would see it. And assuming you see colors, you'll, you'll see it correctly. This is some, how someone with a particular kind of, of colorblindness, protonopia, 
would see this page. So notice that So we'll just find a good example. Notice that this line, these two colors look very different for someone that can see because distinguished colors, but all those colors look the same or virtually the same for people that are colorblind. And you can pick the kind of color blindness you want and it will filter the page and it will show you. So someone that has this form of color blindness, this is what they would see. Well, this is a blue and yellow color blindness. So yeah, there is a form that wouldn't see the blues quite as well. And so on. Now, another thing that you can do, which is really great, is give users choices. <coughs> so if you give, and again, that's a form of multiple presentation. Now, we haven't covered how to change style sheets. But we've seen that you can apply different style sheets to different pages, right? And with just a little snippet of JavaScript in your code, you can actually switch and say, all right, let people decide. Pick the color combination that works best for you. And then you can go and give them some choices, all right, uh, that they can use and they can customize your page based on um, their preferences or their abilities. Customization and allowing people to choose how they want pages to appear really is way up on the list of accessibility because it gives people choice. So if they have a particular situation, if they have bad eyesight and have color blindness, they can, they can customize it for their distinct, unique situation and make it look exactly where the way they want to. What we're going to do next time is we are going to continue on this discussion and talk about some of the other disabilities that you might have. We've really mainly talked about vision so far, but I want to talk about some of the other ones that people mentioned that I said we'd get back to later, as well as some ones that we may not have thought about. So this is what I have for today. Uh, we'll see you up in lab. Question or comment? Yeah. Right. I'm sure the textbook has information on forms. Uh, I can adjust the due date. Okay. Uh, I'm sure if you did went to W3 schools, there would be something on forms. Uh, we did miss the one day. That probably is what put us behind for that. Um, if you uh, need more time to work on it, um, when is it due? Next week? Is due Wednesday? Yeah, if you're going to be late with it, that's fine. I understand. Because again, would be approximately, we have about maybe part of a class and then we'll start on forms. So uh, if I didn't miss last Monday, we probably would be on track to get that done on time. But if it takes you another few days, that's okay. All right, so yeah, don't press it. I'm not so unreasonable that if I haven't covered something to expect you to have it done. Otherwise, you'll end up talking about me in your other classes. All right. Yeah, we'll see you at lab. <laughs>